And uh, we are very proud to have uh, Martin and Jan with us talking about uh, machine learning at uh, Google. So we are just going to go over the rules first. Uh, I'm going to now, in chat, I'm going to put a link to Slido. We're going to use Slido for question, questions and answers later on whenever each speaker finishes his presentation. So feel free to ask anything there. Then next thing, uh, if you want to uh, say your question out loud, you can always use a raise hand emoji. Just put it in the chat, this one as well. Most importantly, mute your mics when uh, a presenter is doing his presentation so we can all hear clearly. Uh, and at the end, I have to say that this is going to be a recorded session, just the presentation, so just a heads up. And I'm going to start recording. Oh, it's already recording. OK. Uh, thank you, whoever pushed the record button. So yeah, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, as I said, it's a, a, a machine learning session at uh, Google Siri. We have uh, two of our uh, presenters. And we're going to start with the first one, which is going to be Jan. So Jan van der Kerkhoff is an AIT Digital Data Science alumnus. He is a class of 2016, and he studied at Alto and KTH. He's originally from the Netherlands, and currently he's a tech lead for YouTube movies and shows at Google, and he's working on movie recommendation quality and products discovery. So that's about Jan. Please, Jan, the floor is yours. I'm going to mute my mic. Cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the introduction, uh, Davor. So um, I won't really be looking at the time, so please tell me if I'm running over time. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be giving a talk of like uh, how machine learning is applied at Google. And um, I'll mostly just be covering public materials. So um, I hope that uh, some, of, like, some of this may actually be familiar to you, to you guys. So I hope I'm not like repeating a lot of stuff that you know. I try to uh, put in a little bit of my own, own wisdom into it as well. Um, so let me see. Uh, yeah, so about me, um, I've been at Google for almost four years now, and most of these I've been working on features that involve applied machine learning. And so some of these features include, uh, um, yeah, so I was, I was at email first for almost three years, and then I switched to YouTube, where I'm working on move recommendations. And so I've, I've been in, I, yeah, I've been working with features such as, for instance, Smart Reply, like in Gmail, if you have an email, um, Gmail will propose to you three suggestions of automated uh, responses, so you can just really quickly reply to an email. There's other features such as Gmail Smart Compose, where if you're typing, uh, it'll try and autocomplete it for you to kind of speed up your typing on um, uh, on, on on mobile and also uh, on web. And then there's of course YouTube Movies and Shows, which I'm currently working for. It's on YouTube um, where you can basically rent or buy uh, various movies and shows. Uh, and here I'm working on recommendations quality. So I'm also very familiar with the YouTube uh, recommendations algorithm. So I thought we could do a little bit of a case study and see like how is machine learning applied um, across Gmail and also across YouTube uh, from my experience. And uh, I, I thought I'd start with a little pop quiz and I think uh, people can just maybe just type their answers into the chat of, of what you think makes a good machine learning feature or specifically what do you need in order to actually build a good machine learning feature. I'll give a couple of seconds for people to type something if they want. Any takers? Pretend it's a human. <laughs> Non-biased. It's inclusive. That's going to be our next talk, I think. Um, I think these these were not really the, the features I worked on were not really built to be inclusive. Um, but yeah, anyways, this this was not really obvious to me when I joined Google. But I think sort of the first high precision and recall, of course, um, not evil. <laughs> Generalized, of course, this is what you do with uh, machine learning. I think the, yeah, for me, the most, the most important thing that I didn't realize is like 
you need to have the training data. That's like, that's where it starts. Like you might think like, ah, oh, I'm going to build such a great feature. And then um, it turns out that you can't, you don't really have any training data or you have some sort of surrogate data set that you try and model your feature over and then try and like apply it to um, a different domain. And that, that usually doesn't really work. Um, the second one is really what, what makes a really successful feature is if you model an organic user behavior. So for instance, for Gmail Smart Reply, the, the thing that they model is something really organic. Like they have Gmail training data and then they model a reply to an email. So this is super easy from a data perspective because you have your, you have your emails and you have your replies. The only thing, like, uh, you basically have almost unlimited training data and you're modeling something really organic. Um, and the third one is that uh, you can measure your feature quality uh, based on system metrics. So you might build like, uh, for instance, in Gmail, you may build like a, a feature that summarizes your email. Um, but you may be able to build like a first model and then figure out, ah, oh, it's not really working well. Uh, but if you want to improve your model, then it's going to become really hard because you can't really measure the quality of your model unless um, you can do that organically through the system. So for instance, for Smart Reply, they can do this through actually measuring like how much is Smart Reply used across the system. And if we build a new model, is it going to be better than the previous model? And I think if you have these three things, then you're all set to actually build your machine learning feature. And, and I think really like the, the least important out of all of this is, is actually your machine learning approach. Like if you do something simple, it usually already um, performs really well. And you can throw like a whole bunch of complicated machine learning at it. Um, it it's usually really, really hard to get, to get better than like your simple approach, given that you, you have all these prerequisites. Um, so we can have a look first at um, Smart Reply and how that, how that works. So Smart Reply is a pretty big feature. It drives, um, uh, it drives about 12% of all responses in Gmail. I think this, this number is actually bigger right now. Um, and, and so as mentioned before, like, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward because you're training directly on Gmail data. Um, you're modeling an organic interaction, which is like a reply. Um, and, you can mod and you can measure your usage stats organically throughout the system. Um, and there was two versions of Smart Reply. The first one was an LSDM version, which was um, you know, more sort of standard ML, how you would do sequence to sequence modeling. And then there was the optimized version, which used a dual tower encoder, which I thought was a really interesting optimization that uh, I don't think a lot of people know about. Um, so sort of on a, on a high level in Smart Reply, can you guys see my cursor, by the way? So on a high level, like your email comes in, um, the system pre-processes it, so it extracts all the engrams and all the stuff. A small ML model, which is trained to predict whether or not we should reply to this email. Um, it, you know, we don't want to over-trigger it. We don't want to... We don't want to also waste resources uh, generating the right response. So most of most emails are filtered out, and then if we want to do a if we want to trigger a response, then um, we run this LSTM model that um, predicts like the probability of one of uh, many different allowed responses. So here, there's an allow list built in where. Um, you know, we don't want to. We don't want to have the model suggest any any sort of thing because it might be very insensitive. That might be considered uh, racist or like all sorts of things here. If you if you let the model run wild, so we do have a, a set of permitted um, responses. Uh, after the model predicts its responses, there's a certain diversity selection that comes into play, where we predict either like we want, for instance two positive replies, but we also want one negative replies, sort of for functionality of the, of the feature. And then we, uh, we basically give back the replies. And um, I think the, the first thing that they did was like build a data set of all the allowed responses, uh, which was actually the most sort of manual work that went into the feature. Uh, what they basically did was they mined Gmail for say the, 
top million most likely responses, then they did some sort of manual labor labeling where they applied clusters to each of these uh, responses. So, uh, for instance, here you would have like Thursday evening as a reply would be labeled with time of day, and how about today would be labeled with how about time, and then how about Friday would be um, labeled by this expander algorithm to um, basically be like how about time. It, it would be closer to that specific cluster. And they ran a bunch of iterations on this and they, um, you know, there was a lot of manual work involved in actually getting this right. But then once they had this, most of the other stuff was really automated and now. Um, and so initially what they did was they used this LSTM. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but um, what happens is it has these cells um, and it, it basically passes on its state from step to step and you feed it a sequence of text so you would feed it the incoming email with are you free tomorrow then there would be some sort of encoding and from that encoding you allow the model to basically generate the response so for this email are you free tomorrow then yes what's up would be one of the most um familiar or most likely responses um and and they basically built in this sort of beam search so that at each point there would be a probability distribution over which token would come next and then they would pick the 20 most likely ones and start generating from that so that they would have like 100 or like 200 different responses in the end. And, and this initially was like a great application of machine learning, right? Because you, you take something out of a theory and you apply it directly, um, which is an LSDM, which was really hip, like I think four years ago. Um, but this model is really expensive to run. Because it has all these, it has like hundreds of thousands of parameters. Um, you need to run it multiple times over in order to generate your generate multiple responses. So what they did is they they optimized this, and I think they optimized this in a really nice way. Um, the optimization that they did was they built this sort of dual tower encoder model, and this model is really great at matching an input with a set of candidates. So here we have like this allow list of like, I don't know, 300,000 likely responses. And what we want to do is we want to compute uh, the most likely response. And we just have our input email and we want to uh, compute the score of how likely each of these responses is. And what they did is basically, they simplified it really where um, they have a bunch of features. So here, on the left side is like the input, um, that's what you call input features, and the others is response features. So the email body and the subject line, both of these have this sort of tower encoding with it. And this tower encoding is just a feed forward neural network. It uses bag of word embeddings, um, which is a really sort of simple embedding. Um, and what it does is, um, yeah, so, so let's have a look at, at sort of the top level um, where you, you basically compute for your input and for your response, you compute an embedding, which is a vector of 300, um, 300 floats. And then you multiply those with each other and that gives you your final output score. And um, they did this sort of hierarchic, hierarchical architecture um, to basically ensure that each of these features gets used. But the, the, the whole trick is like you compute a vector of 300 dimensions um, and you can basically your quality of matches the dot product between those two vectors. And the nice thing about that is that this whole stuff, um, the response towers can be separated from the input towers and so basically you can pre-compute this vector for each of your likely responses. You can pre-compute it and store it in some sort of hyper-optimized index. So when you're serving, the only thing that you need to do is basically compute this one input embedding for your email. And then you can do some super optimized dot product between that input email and all the likely responses. And so this, this saves Google a whole bunch of resources because they didn't need to run this LSTM at e every single incoming email. All they needed to do was do this sort of hyper-optimized dot product, which was uh, way cheaper. And 
I think this is such a nice optimization and, and you can see this sort of optimization across, uh, across different products. Um, so that's it for smart reply. Then let's move on to YouTube a little bit. And um, at YouTube, what they use machine learning for, like machine learning is like heavily embedded in all the recommendations algorithms. Um, and, you know, going back, like they, they really trained on like organic metrics, such as clicks, um, watch time, uh, and, they're, and they're trained on like actual YouTube interactions. So you take your training data, you say like, oh, these are the, the the, you know, these are the videos shown to the user, and this was the one that the user clicked on. That's it. There's no sort of transfer learning or, um, yeah. It's, 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 it's a very direct way of modeling this. And um, here as well, like, we try and predict a bunch of these metrics. So we try and predict, like, click-through rate or watch time um, and, and just show suggestions based on that. And here we can really easily measure all these improvements to the models and A-B experiments. So you can just through the interactions with the system, you can you can just iterate on the model. Um, and, and here neural nets are really like the main source of recommendations um, versus like more traditional things such as collaborative filtering, which I've seen in my studies, but neural nets are really like the, the way to go here. Um, and so the over, like on a high level, it kind of works like this where we we have like a video corpus of, of millions of, of videos. Um, there we have this phase called candidate generation, which selects like say hundreds or thousands of these videos to be finally scored and ranked. Um, we use like a user history and like whatever context the user is in to actually generate these candidates. But um, then once they are, once we have this pre-selection, then we do this more expensive step, which is ranking where we predict clicks through rate or watch time and we use that to rank the videos. And then we show dozens of those to the users. And um, yeah, so basically um, this is the candidate generation network. And again, it's it's a pretty straightforward network, right? It's, it's like a simple sort of feed forward neural net. Um, and I think what's kind of interesting here is that they've modeled it as a classification problem rather than this sort of, you know, dot product. Um, the dot product comes back and you'll see why, but they basically take, um, they try and predict the distribution of how likely a user is to click on one of several million videos. So this model does a soft max over say, I don't know, like 2 million uh, of the most popular videos and uses that as sort of a, a candidate generation um, step and yeah, here there's a, a bunch of features. It's not not really too too interesting, but um, what they do then is again this um, sort of softmax operation is again um, optimized in the sense that they they basically extract all the weights for each of the candidates, which is essentially a vector. So then at serving time. And, and that, that doesn't change either for those candidates. And then at serving time, all they have to do is compute this final layer, which is they call the user vector, and then uh, compute like this hyper-optimized nearest neighbor uh, dot product, again, to get the top, say, couple hundred suggestions. Um, finally, we can look at scoring, where, again, scoring is kind of similar, where they have, again, like a straightforward, uh, more or less, a neural network. Um, they do add more features to this model. So they add features about the video that is being scored, which are more expensive to extract. And they add features about the user as well, um, where they have like language embeddings. Um, they do some sort of optimization. They, they normalize each of the features that is being put into the model. Um, but basically, they feed it all through, and then in the end, they use that to predict click-through rates and expected watch time, and, and and those are then used to to rank these um, to rank you see finally. Um, I think that more or less covers it on a on a high level. I, I kind of rushed through this, so I, I uh, I'm happy to take any questions if things were unclear. Um, that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, Please email me if you 
like have any questions after this after this talk, or uh, you want to know a little bit more about Google or Zurich, then I'm always I'm always happy to chat and um, and help with whatever I can. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, it was a really interesting talk about uh, smart replies, a feature of NLP and uh, YouTube recommendations. And now we can see if you have any questions already. Yeah, there's one. Uh, Ruth is asking, what about the personalization? As uh, he would never respond with, yes, what's up? Like something informal. Yeah, so this is quite interesting because people actually think that smart reply is personalized. And they start saying like, oh, wow, I would learn from the way that I write emails, but there is there is no personalization. It's it's just um, you know it's it's the same for every user basically. And what was interesting to see was that at some point we we got this sort of user uh, user feedback of like, oh wow, it's really learning. But it's it's just that people get used to the way that Smart Reply suggests it. And I think it's like some sort of inception that you think that you're supposed to respond like that. So at some point, people started using it more. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? Uh, if not, I think I can. Oh, Arud is again asking, did you try personalization? I, th I think I answered that one. Yeah, well, yeah I think it's uh, already the same question. Uh, Oh, uh, Paul is asking, do you create the recommendations instantly or you prepare them? For which? Um, I think he's asking about probably Reader, right? Um, so they are, uh, yeah, no, they're instant. They're instantly, yeah. Because you might, like, the recommendation might, for instance, depend on the time of day or the video that you're currently watching or things like that. Um, so you can't you can't really prepare everything. Mm -hmm, I see. Uh, while we wait for the questions, I also want to ask uh, uh, about the smart reply. I don't know if the question makes any sense or you can answer it, but you said you are using LSTM, and mm -hmm. I had this professor at KTH who said like everything should be viewed as a graph, and I have seen that there's a, a, a resurgence of these GNNs or graph neural networks. Is it something that should be used instead of LSTM, which LSTM is much standard technique. So I'm not really familiar with the graph neural nets, um, but yeah, I'm I'm not really sure. I, I feel like I feel like for Google, it's really like for a feature like this, you're really trying to op optimize for uh, performance over actual quality, and I think um, it might be that these graph neural nets are quite expensive to run. So also because Google stepped away from actually using these LSTMs because they were so expensive. Um, one of the things that is actually making a, a resurgence or that's uh, kind of the newest thing is uh, transformer networks. I think there's also a paper about it. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, if you search for transformer paper, then, then you'll find it. And this is sort of the, the newest version of LSTMs, but it's much less expensive um, to run and it's, uh, it's been outperforming all the LSTMs. Okay, I see. Thank you. Is there anything else? Anybody? Oh, there's one more. Uh, what's the improvements paid for Gmail smart reply? For example, training data and evaluation. Uh, so could you repeat that? Sorry, I was looking at the chat. I think there's also a question. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so someone asked, what's the improvements paid for Gmail smart reply? For example, training data and evaluation. So I think Gmail Smart Reply is pretty much finished. Um, it's like I think they consider it like more or less done. Um, it's been it's being applied now to different areas, but they're not uh, they're not really optimizing for it anymore. It's also hard to put like a you know at some point you need to kind of accept that the feature is good enough, and um, there is not really that much benefit at this point to actually trying to improve the. The feature even further. Okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Nope. Oh, there one was one in the chat one. about um, Stefano is asking how hard it is to get into Google Zurich without a PhD for working on stuff yeah, related yeah. to machine learning. Um, this is this this depends. So if you're coming in as a software engineer, 
if you're coming in as a software engineer, it's um, it's not that not that difficult because you can just come in and then you know try and find a project that's related to machine learning. That's that's how I did it. Um, if you're coming for research, it's really hard. So as a as a researcher, you really need a PhD, and you need to be, I think, at the top of the, um, you know, at the top of the candidate pool. Uh, I think, like, I know a friend; he's transferred from um, software engineering into research, which is another possibility. Uh, but it took him like one and a half years of like uh, working his ass off on a on a twenty percent project before he was actually accepted into uh, into research. Thank you. Maybe we can just take this only two more questions about smart reply and then we can answer those and then move to the next presentation. Uh, can sure. you see them or should I read? I can't see them. Uh, okay, so wait, wait, wait. Uh, so someone is asking, uh, he's a non machine learning person and uh, wants to know is smart reply working on word by word to guess the reply or is it working on a whole sentence? It's working on the whole um, the whole content of your email. So it basically like it encodes like your whole email as a sort of um, yeah, sort of bag of words uh, vector and uses that as input to the model. Okay, thank you. I think we can like uh, continue discussion after the talks, and now we can move out to our next speaker. Sure. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Maciej Paskiewicz, and he's an EIT Digital Data Science alumnus as well. Class of 2019, studied in Milano and Madrid. He's originally from Poland, uh, currently software engineer at Google, working on Lens, which is a product that enables users to search what they see. He's passionate about computer vision, and he's going to talk about machine learning fairness. So Maciej, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Davor, for the introduction. Guys, do you, do you see my presentation? Everything is uh, is okay. Yeah, but it's not in the presentation. Uh, ah, more. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's good. Yeah. So first of all, thank you, Davor, for uh, for having us here and for creating this platform for like sharing knowledge and different thoughts among uh, EIT community members. I think it's a great initiative. So. Like a few words about uh, about me. So I recently joined uh, Google in Zurich, and I work on Google Lens, which is a tool that um, enables users to search what they see. So basically, it means that you can take the picture of whatever is around you, like I don't know, a dog, and then you can learn what's what's the breed of the dog. You can also take the picture of some product, and Lens will tell you what's the price of this product and where you can buy it. And what I find the, the most useful about Lens is that you can also, uh, it can also like detect text and you can like mm, run many actions on the text. Like you can just translate, copy, or see how the text is pronounced in some foreign language. So since I joined recently Google, I don't really have like the, the features like 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 yeah, like Jan to to talk about. But I went through like multiple trainings, and it struck me like how much attention Google put into like diversity and inclusion. And I chose the the topic to be the machine learning fairness because I think like the inclusion and social responsivity <clears throat> in AI is uh, is important topic. And I feel also like at university we we focus more on like algorithms and uh, math behind those algorithms, and we sort of like neglected the the social aspect of the machine learning. But actually, I think that when you when you deploy the machine learning for the for the real users, um, there is so many more dimensions than than you have to think about than just like the algorithm or the parameters you have to you have to use. And, and one of those dimensions is, is fairness. Mm. So what the fairness actually is about? So there's uh, no single definition, or at least I, I couldn't find one. But 
the high level of the of the definition of the of the fairness is to build the product and machine learning uh, models for everyone. So it basically means that the model that you've built should be inclusive and should work well for any user, no matter what is the gender, what is the race, ethnicity, mm, nationality, income, like sexual orientation, or like political or religious beliefs. And like to highlight like how, how important it is. So there's like a list of Google AI principles. And like on the second place, there is like, uh, there is a statement that avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. So I think that's, that's an important topic. And if you look at uh, the history of the research around fairness in ML, so you can see that it's a relatively new topic. And every year there are more and more papers published. And I think we just, as like uh, engineers, we just like, realized that the machine learning is, is, is everywhere. And it's our like responsibility to make sure that it works well for, for everyone. And I think it's like also like a common mistake to think that the machine learning, just because it's like, it's machine that it's learning, it's, it's objective. It's actually not because on the heart of machine learning, you have data. And because data is generated and produced by, by human, it can be highly biased. So let me give you an example of the unfair machine learning model. So here you can see um, a few pictures depicting uh, like the wedding ceremony in different parts of the world. And below you have output labels of the image classifier trained on open images data set, which is like a huge open source data set used um, frequently as like a research benchmark. And as you can see the on the right picture was uh, incorrectly classified. And this is where the machine learning model is, is unfair. It basically, uh, the, the data it was trained on was not good geographically diverse enough and it is underperforming for some group of users. And um, what's important is that the, the human bias can like enter the, the machine learning pipeline, pipeline or like the, the product that you have, like on many different states from like the data collection through how you label or who labels the data to how you define the, the learning procedures, how you define the loss function, or even how you present the final results and how you collect the feedback. Like on every, on each of these steps, you can as, expect that some of the human bias can, can enter the technology. And it's, uh, it's really important that like all different people working on all different stages of the machine learning pipeline, like in any different laws, in roles, starting from like the researchers, engineers, and like UX designers, they take effort to make sure that the technology works well for, for everyone. And of course there will be like a trade-off between the fairness and the accuracy. Because originally, when you only focus on the on the accuracy, you only focus on the accuracy. But if you also consider the fairness, sort of your objective like shifts, uh, and now you not only focus on the accuracy, but also like on the accuracy and the fairness. So it will always be a trade-off. But there's like a few guidelines you can always follow to make sure that uh, your model is inclusive. So first of all, what you have to do, you have to somehow measure if, uh, if your model is, is, is fair for everyone. So how you can do it, you can just take some performance metrics and instead of applying it globally for the whole uh, evaluation data set, you can apply the metrics, uh, you can measure the metrics for individual groups. And then you can see like how the, the performance of your model changes over time for different groups. And also, like I mentioned before, the, the heart of your model is the, is the data. So like the first thing you should make, you should make uh, sure of is that the data on which you train is like diversified in, in multiple dimensions. And like the example of the dimension might be that 
it comes with like multiple users from different cultural contexts, from different locations, and the data was collected in, in different contexts. And just not only focus on the on having like a diversified training set, but also make sure that your evaluation set and like your test set is like uh, equally diversified. But even if you have like ideally diversified uh, data set, you can still miss out some like really minor group of uh, users. So you should also look for the blind spots and make sure that you don't leave out any group of users. But now, even if you have like perfectly diversified uh, data set that covers all group of users, you may still have some like imbalances between the classes in your data set that may affect the performance for different individual groups. So one of the techniques you can use, you can use uh, active sampling, which basically means that you sample more from, mm, from those areas where your uh, model underperforms. And uh, last but not least, you can always like uh, introduce a penalty term in your loss function. And one of the popular uh, popular like uh, penalty terms is that you actually mm, enforce your model to optimize the differences, to minimize the differences between the performance between different groups of individuals. One, one technique I also found interesting is called uh, removers and block lists. So in this technique, the idea is that uh, you try to remove the information from the data set, or like you try to protect your model. You, you try to hide the information from the model that may lead to skewed outcomes. So imagine that we have a problem of sentiment analysis and there is a sentence that says, uh, this person is a man and comes from Australia. Now, if you remove the, pencil, the person's gender and nationality and replace it with a more generic tag, like gender or nationality, your model won't have an access to the information and won't be able to make decisions, different decisions, based on the person's gender or nationality. And thus, it will perform equally well, no matter what is uh, this person's gender or nationality. So like training the, collecting the data and training the, your model is one thing, but also what's important is how you present the results and how you collect the feedback. Just make sure that the feedback you collect from the users is also diverse, because if you collect the feedback only from the single group of users, over time, you will introduce the improvements and you will iterate on your model. And in some point, you will start to see that you, you began to favor uh, like a single group of your users. Mm. Also, like bear in mind that collecting feedback in some specific way may suit some people more and some people less. So make sure that in your product, you offer multiple ways to collect feedback. So each of your users can find like a, mm, a way to provide feedback that is best for, for him or her. Um, and also like there are problems where you may have like multiple correct answers. And one of those problems is like, for example, translation, where if you translate a sentence from uh, language A to language B, Actually, the final translation maybe like there will be like multiple um, correct translations which are which are equally good, and if you always present one, you may actually favor some group of users more than other. So make sure that you either provide all the answers, or I don't know, maybe even you can like randomize your your responses. Uh, so that would be all from me. If uh, if you if you are maybe interested in the fairness, there's like a few tools you can try out. I find the what if tool, which is like a diagnostic tool from from Google. You can try it out on the example, 
and see how like tuning your model, how changing different mm, different things affects the the model fairness. And also there is uh, like a TensorFlow built-in tool, which is called Fairness Indicators, that allows you to visualize and evaluate model performance, like slice across uh, different uh, user groups. And also there is uh, like a blog post from Google on the develop Google Developers page, which I found like very useful in preparing for this presentation. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, we are now open for the questions regarding this presentation of machine learning fairness. And let me see if we have already something there. Uh, nothing yet. I, I guess I can ask then until we have something uh, written down. Maybe more, uh, because I know that Google actually created this uh, machine learning fairness and uh, is working on it. But do we see any implementations of it in the real world? I would say uh, marketing or even uh, uh, bank loans, uh, because I don't see it's being implemented in the real world. Is there something that is missing for it to go maybe viral? It, yeah, I think, think, yeah. um, I think one of the, the examples I know is uh, the Google Translate where um, where for example uh, the google translate over time it was like learning on the on the people translations that the people provided and the google translate team learned that uh, since they are retraining the models on like a user data like provided by by users the models start to like incorporate like the common stereotypes and like you like end up in a translation that is like um, the man is a doctor or like a woman is a nurse, where in fact there was like no clear indication was the, the, the gender of the, the noun. So this was like unexpected news like a failure. Okay. And I it was addressed. Yeah. Hi, Martin. Um... What would you reply to people who point out that uh, uh, trying to play with uh, the what is like uh, uh, fair or not uh, is actually uh, uh, placing some bias? So, for example, uh, operating on fairness itself is a bias. Uh, let's say uh, you, you can recall, for example, when there were all these uh, huge discussion about uh, people that were hired that were not male nor uh, black people because of a model that was only suggesting white candidates. But at the same time, when we actually uh, train or act on a model to play it more fairly, isn't it a bias itself? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. So I think, uh, I think what's, for, for me at least was the most important is to like create the models in a way that you at least like don't reinforce the bias or because if you if you uh, if you just learn from the training set and if you don't consider the, the fairness you will for sure incorporate the bias that is in the in the data yeah but maybe uh, it's like a question to, to the people who develop like, what do you care about the most? Do you, do you care more about the accuracy of your model or do you care more about it works equally well for everyone? And I believe that the second option is, is better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, I see your point. Um, I was thinking that of course it's a, uh, it's, um, there's a lot of differences in uh, like cultural differences and what we think it's fair could be completely different in other cultures. And I, I also can, can bring in examples and I can understand that it's uh, in a way very difficult to try to balance something that uh, we think it is fair and other cultures or other countries, other people might think not. Yeah, I think we were like entering like the infinite loop yeah, where we try to remove the bias, and we have also the bias. <laughs> so uh, it's like an infinite problem, I think. Yeah. 
Thanks for answering. Okay, I think we don't have any more questions. I, I think that might be it, actually. I have, if, if we have some time, I have a, a nice point yeah, yeah, please. to that. Um, so I, I think in America, there is like machine learning models trained to actually predict whether or not people were eligible for a loan. And back in the day, there was this practice where people would look at like, uh, which neighborhood do you live in? And then basically just redline the whole neighborhood on a map and say like, if you live in that neighborhood, then um, you wouldn't be able to get a loan. And this would be like very detrimental to people like of minorities living in those neighborhoods. And when they started training machine learning models to actually, you know, to give out these loans or, or uh, figure if somebody was eligible for a loan, but machine learning models started doing exactly this practice, this redlining, which was uh, actually considered illegal uh, nowadays. Um, it, it really started saying like, ah, you come from that neighborhood, like you're not getting it alone. Um, so I think there's like also here, it's I think an example of where kind of law and like our culture really clearly states that something shouldn't be biased. And then our, our machine learning models tend to be just because they try and find these like patterns. Yeah, I guess we also have a comment from Jose Carlos saying that in his view, this is a really challenging topic and a more question about policies, societal action. And he's kind of having this uh, philosophical question, is affirmative action trying to be more inclusive actually a form of discrimination itself? So I guess you are referring to a positive discrimination. Yeah, I, I, exactly, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't think probably Machin could be able to answer from a machine learning point of view because it, it is but that policies are actually, I would say, uh, kind of making a change within uh, AI itself. But you can go, Jose. No, yeah, I was also asking a, a question in the um, Slido. So I, I'm not sure if I missed the explanation, but what was the exact reason there is always uh, some trade-off between accuracy and fairness? Why can't you apply both at the same time? So, so if, if you start and uh, in, in your beginning, your objective is uh, just accuracy, you will like optimize for the accuracy. But when then you decide that uh, you, you want your model to be more fair for all the user groups, you actually introduce like the another objective and the problem becomes more complex and you will lose the, the accuracy basically. So, it, it, so maybe like an example. So imagine that uh, the model works well for like 99% of users and works terribly for like 1% of users. So the question is, the accuracy of your model will be like 99%. But now if you see that this 1% is, for example, a single user group, which means that like some specific user group, like the model completely doesn't work for them. And if you want to change that, your accuracy, like the overall accuracy of your model will probably decrease. Is that Jose the answer to your question? Yes, thanks. Uh, I understand now. Also, one question about the lens. Uh, does the lens start collecting the data it's seeing as soon as it launches? Mm. I don't know who asked it in an anonymous. I don't know. So I know that you can opt in, in and donate the images, but if you don't opt in, I don't think it's collecting anything. I see. Uh, that's, I, I don't see any more questions. So if, oh, there's another one. Uh, how much product development is done in Siri, Google Siri, or is most of product development done in MV? Yeah, so Mountain View is like the Google headquarters. There is, uh, I don't know, correct, correct me, Jan, if I'm wrong, but I think there's like 
thousands of engineers working, and I think Zurich office is maybe like 10% of Mountain View office. I'm not so, sure. I think Zurich, like Zurich is like huge as well. Um, yeah, so definitely like the Zurich is like the main European hub, uh, like engineering hub. Mm. But uh, I think like the that Mountain View is still like the, the leader, global leader. I think it also depends on the product. So there's some products that are really like only in Google, such as Google Maps and Google Flights. Um, Gmail used to be split between Mountain View and, um, <clears throat> and Zurich. Uh, but for instance, for the team I'm working for YouTube movies and shows, even though YouTube is actually in San Bruno in the US, like we own our entire product. So um, any sort of product development that happens for movies and shows actually happens in, in Zurich. But also, I, I've heard that actually this uh, office in Zurich is the main European one for artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, I'm still looking at the questions. There's nothing on uh, Slido. There's nothing in the chat. So I guess we could actually call it today. Uh, and I just want to say a really big thank you to Jan and Marcin. So, Jacque and Marcin, danke vel Jan. It's been really nice. Uh, I think we learned a lot during uh, this last hour. And uh, I think we can also stop recording because now we are going to start our uh, just hangout. And before you, some of you leave, just let me copy paste. There's a link to the there's a link to the feedback form, so please just uh, fill in the feedback form so we can know how to make these events even better in the future. Okay, so the party can get started.